what's the point of having a parachain to begin with, right? Because we talked about the option system and the cool features that can happen around it, but naturally, what would be the reason somebody would want to have a side chain? It's because you can take advantage of the security, the scalability and in interoperability of Polkadot, which means that if you become a parachain, you can then communicate to other parachains. What's going on, everybody? This is Professor Crypto Banana, and today I'm doing an interview with Crypto's Chain. He's big into the DOT ecosystem and is definitely going to give me a crash course. Please keep in mind that everything in this video is not financial advice. It's just for entertainment and educational purposes only. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is actually Claudio, and I run the YouTube channel of Crypto's Chain, uh, which is mostly focused on doing Polkadot content. Uh, sometimes I cover the Cosmos ecosystem as well. I've recently started with Sui and Aptos, but then since the Sam Bankman Freed issue and Alameda, you know, it's not probably not a safe uh, ecosystem to talk about, at least not at the moment. So I'm going to step back from that, even if some of the projects building on there seem interesting, because at the end of the day, they're not really related to Aptos and to Sui and their investors. They just want to build, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, Polkadot is my main focus since like the end of 2020. And uh, I've been covering a lot of information in relation to uh, the builders on top of Polkadot. So it's the layer ones because Polkadot itself is a layer zero. And I know many content creators and also general community members don't uh, understand that difference between the layer zeros and the layer ones. Many people consider Polkadot a layer one. And I know it's been mentioned many times and we always have to correct them. But yeah, it's a layer zero. It means that you cannot build anything on Polkadot itself. You can only build on something on top of Polkadot to connect to it and use um, this, the scalability features, the security features that Polkadot has to offer. And of course, the interoperability feature, which is uh, one that's really, really crucial, I think, for the... Let's talk about Cosmos, right? Because Cosmos seems to be similar to Dot, right? How, how is the background of it? Is there one that you prefer? And how did the timeline come about it? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I, I really like what Cosmos are doing. They're also working on interoperability. They've actually started before Polkadot, so they definitely have that first mover advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the disadvantages with Cosmos is that they've got a different system. So uh, they're a layer zero as well, but then any of the uh, applications or the blockchains that are the layer ones on top of it uh, and are connected to it actually get... Um, actually win because they're funded by the, not win, but they, they actually become a blockchain because they're funded by the Cosmos treasury. And so they've got a different system in place and then they connect to the Cosmos blockchain itself and they take advantage of the security of the ecosystem and so on, right? Uh, but the way to actually get the coins, which are behind each of these projects on Cosmos is through a method of airdrops, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Whereas on Polkadot, it doesn't work like that. It's about trying to win a parachain auction. And that's something that we can dig into. Uh, it is a complex topic, but we can definitely explain uh, the difference and uh, how it actually works in terms of the, the, the auction system. Whereas, yeah, with Cosmos, because it's an airdrop system, my only concern there is that you actually need to stake uh, Atom. And uh, if you stake Atom in your wallet and uh, you get an airdrop of a certain coin and you need to claim that airdrop, you usually need to connect your website, connect your wallet to a website. And uh, you've all seen what uh, scams there are in crypto, right? And um, mm -hmm. I mean, the risk there is that you could connect to the wrong uh, application, uh, to a fake one, and uh, you could lose Oliver Atom. And so that's, uh, that's one of the red flags for me personally when it comes to the Cosmos ecosystem. It's just the way they manage the airdrop system. But I think if they could airdrop directly uh, to your wallet without you having to log in anywhere, and uh, then that would be fine. That would be perfect because that would just mean that you're staking Adam. You may be taking part in governance and then you're eligible for a bigger airdrop of uh, that specific um, project's coin, right? The layer ones that are building on top of it. But let's not forget that Cosmos, just like on Polkadot, also have the layer twos. So there are the layer one blockchains, uh, which we can all see in that uh, Kepler wallet that they use. But then the cool thing is that uh, on top of that, you also got the dApps. So each one of those, like you've seen with Terra Luna, right? There was Terra Luna and that had a whole ecosystem. Unfortunately, yeah. that did crash, right? But then there's uh, Juno, for example, which are working with uh, EVMs, with uh, the Ethereum virtual machine, and they're connecting any of the dApps from, the, from Ethereum over to Cosmos. And so they've got their own ecosystem growing there. So all those layer twos that are building on it are helping Juno grow and therefore helping Cosmos grow. And so it's kind of the similar, it's kind of a similar situation with Polkadot except they use the auction system. 
So dive in more into the auction system then. What was it all about? What's what's the big idea? Okay, so yeah, um, basically, like I said, Polkadot is a layer zero, which means that you cannot build any applications on top of it, but you can connect blockchains on top of it. And these blockchains on Polkadot are called parachains. Think of it like side chains, because mm -hmm. they are ultimately connected to Polkadot and they're communicating to Polkadot, right? When it comes to blocks and to transactions. Uh, but the difference here is that it does have its own independent chain creating blocks from Genesis. So the moment that a power chain launches, it starts producing blocks, right? And those blocks uh, can also produce coins. That's, of course, if the team decide to mint those coins, because uh, ultimately you can't have a blockchain without coins, but then you cannot transact on it, right? So uh, this is where the beauty of it comes into play. So in order for a project, let's say, for example, uh, you want to create the Professor Crypto Banana Parachain, right? And then, so what you do is uh, you reach out to the Parity team, you tell them, look, I'm interested to create this. Uh, what do I do? Where do I look? And so they'll probably refer you to the wiki page of Polkadot, which has all the technical instructions on what you need to do to set up your parachain. But before you become a parachain, you actually need to start off as a para thread. So what you do is you actually test things out on the test network, which is called Rokoku. Uh, once you finish testing and everything's fine, you move on to become a para thread. And then you start producing blocks, but you don't have a coin yet. Keep that in mind. And then what actually happens is on a specific date and time when the team announces that the auction kicks off, uh, you would then enter into a kind of a, a lease period, not a lease period, but you would propose the lease that you want to go for. So for example, if you want to go and get a, a slot on Polkadot, you would propose the 22 month lease. Uh, but it would be on certain slots because the way it works is every auction uh, works on slots. So you may have auction one, slot one, then auction two, slot two, and so on. So maybe you want to take part in auctions one to five. And so in this case, you would lease for a, um, slot one to five, right? Mm -hmm. And so what you would do is you would go in as a power thread and you would say, I want to raise $100,000 from the community, right? In terms of contribution in order for, my, for me to become a parachain, in order for the Professor Crypto Banana parachain to happen, right? Mm -hmm. And so what you would do is you would say to the community, uh, look, if you help contribute DOT uh, towards my uh, para thread to become a parachain in this auction, uh, then I will give you 100 tokens or coins for each one DOT that you decide to contribute. And so the community would start contributing and then you would have a cap, right? Let's say the cap is 100,000 DOT. And so if you don't reach that cap uh, by the end of the lease, if there's nobody else competing with you in that auction, then you will become a parachain when the lease is over. And those, uh, and, sorry, when the auction's over. And you, these auctions actually last for two weeks on Polkadot and one week on Kusama. We can talk about Kusama after just so we don't confuse things. Uh, but uh, yeah, so the, the auction lasts for two weeks. You enter on day one, let's say, for example. You get those contributions. You don't max out that contribution of uh, 100 or that, um, sorry, the allocation of $100,000, uh, but you still win the auction because there's nobody else competing with you. However, this is where the fun part comes into play. Let's say I decide to want to become a parachain, right? And so I'm also a para thread. I'm taking part competing against you in the same auction. And so now there's two of us. I also want to get $100,000, right, in order to win. And so I'll set my max allocation to 100,000. Yours is 100,000. Let's say you've got 20,000 DOT contributed to yourself right now. I get 10,000. By the end of the auction, after the two weeks end, the person with the most contributions towards is the one that wins the auction. So that's how this actually works. However, it's not always the case. Here's the trick. So let's say, for example, on week one, you've got uh, 10,000 contributions in DOT. And let's say on week one, I've got 5,000. But then on week two, if I get 15,000 and then you remain at 10,000, but uh, let's say on the last two days, yours goes up to like 25,000, which is above mine, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're guaranteed to win because the way the, the power chain auction system works is it uses a candle auction system. So it randomly picks a block, a uh, winning block, basically, when uh, somebody was in the lead. It doesn't matter who because you don't know. It's automatically done by the algorithm. Mm -hmm. behind the scenes, but it automatically picks one so it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you had more dot contributed towards you you'll definitely win so that's the beauty of it do so, you have any questions around that because uh it, it is quite complex i know and absolutely uh but those seems to be like more details but then i'm going to backtrack and say 
what's the point of having a parachain to begin with, right? Because we talked about the option system and the cool features that can happen around it, but naturally, what would be the reason somebody would want to have a side chain, the Professor Crypto Banana chain to begin with? Yeah, I mean, you can, uh, it's because you can take advantage of the security, the scalability and in interoperability of Polkadot, which means that if you become a parachain, you can then communicate to other parachains. If you decide not to become a parachain and step back, but still build on Polkadot, you can do so as a solo chain. So you'd be on top of the substrate framework, which Polkadot is built on top of. And then there's the solo chains, the ones that are independent, independent blockchains from the parachains and parathreads. But mm -hmm. then we have the parachains and parathreads, which can communicate to each other. Remember, you cannot communicate to those solo chains. There's no bridge to those. You can only communicate between parachains. So is the security in the framework of DOT superior to those of other chains? Because what would be stopping me from, let's say, you know, not going through the fundraising, et cetera, and just saying like, screw this, I'm going to go where it's guaranteed, not so much worrying about all the auction system and just go straight there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you could, but let me just talk about that fundraising. So that fundraising is, uh, is not, a, you don't actually get that dot, just to make it clear. So when I was telling you that you're going to set up an allocation of a hundred thousand mm -hmm. and some, and people contribute that dot towards you, you don't actually get that as a project, as a team, right? That gets mm -hmm. locked on a specific, um, not on an address. I would say it's like, it remains in your wallet, but in a frozen state. And so there's actually an actual timer that determines that, uh, that, that gets locked for the 22 month lease during the duration of the parachain lease, right? So mm -hmm. what will happen is the contributors will get their dot back. You don't touch that as a team, but you get the benefit of becoming a parachain and taking and and uh, being able to take advantage of the interoperability and make use of that. Uh, but like you are saying, just to get back to your point. So uh, if, for example, you want to go to a different blockchain, which doesn't have the auction system and all this, then uh, the security is not the same and there may not be any interoperability there either. Because at the moment, uh, like I said to you before, uh, Cosmos and Polkadot are the only ones that offer this interoperability within their own ecosystems. So with Dot, is it interoperable with other chains? So for example, I think Cardano can be interoperable with uh, Ethereum, right? And different chains like Binance Smart Chain can connect and, and whatnot. Is Dot in its own world or can it be EVM compatible? It's EVM compatible, yeah. Unfortunately, not to Binance Smart Chain or Cardano yet, or Solana or Avalanche or any of those. Uh, but there are a bridge, there are projects at the moment building bridges between the Cos between Cosmos and Polkadot, and Ooh. there's one building a bridge between Binance Smart Chain as well and Polygon. So we're gonna see more of that. Nobody building a bridge with Cardano yet, I believe, not as far as I'm aware. But uh, we'll see how things go. Hmm, that's interesting. So another thing that I read was that there is security concerns when it comes to bridging in general, right? That that's a vulnerability. Do yeah. you know anything about that? Or can you talk about that in more detail? When you when you say bridging, do you mean bridging with another blockchain or bridging within the par like within the ecosystem between the parachains? I think both would be a concern, but as of right now, I'd focus on the parachain being able to bridge between it. Is there vulnerabilities? Yeah. Have there been past exploits? No, so that's the beauty of it. So the way it actually works is it doesn't actually use a bridge. It's uh, called a channel. So they use uh, what is known as the HRMP channel. So every parachain can open up a channel with another parachain. And so what actually happens is you send a specific amount of tokens which get verified or coins uh, from the main parachain to the secondary parachain, which is another parachain independently. But you can create another copy of that asset. So your cryptocurrency now becomes a token on that other parachain which you can then use for DEXs, for DeFi, for farming, NFTs, whatever you want to use it for, right? Whatever functionality is available for that specific token, because it does become a token at that time, it's no longer a coin. However, you can always swap that back on a one-to-one -one with the original coin by simply sending it back through that channel. You just basically do a teleport. That's what you call it. It's not even a transfer because you have to teleport when it comes to parachains. You cannot transfer from one parachain to another. Hmm. It's just different naming that they use. And so it is, it is secure because you are ultimately always checking. Uh, it doesn't actually get stored anywhere. That's what I'm trying to say. So uh, basically, the, uh, even though the, um, the coins, the original coins leave your wallet, they, don't actually, they cannot be moved because they don't get moved into a specific address 
where a hacker can access to. So they actually move into a frozen state, just like we've seen with the uh, parachain auctions, like I was explaining to earlier. They never actually leave your wallet, they're frozen, so you cannot interact with them. Uh, but uh, basically it, it's like a copy, it's like a snapshot, so that this, the other parachain knows that these coins exist. So that's how it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting concept. I have to learn more about that. Now, when it comes to certain projects that are building on DOT and the parachains, have you noticed any that have real world utility? For example, I know that there are certain projects that are purchasing actually real estate, right? And then allowing users to get in and participate. Are you aware of any uh, projects out there on DOT or the parachains that are doing something similar? Yeah, I mean, there's one called Centrifuge, uh, which does allow you to tokenize real world assets, but not to purchase real estate uh, within it. So it's it's basically their idea is that they're working with these third party companies, these third party firms, uh, mm -hmm. where they sign contracts and stuff, and you can basically tokenize your car so you can generate uh, real world, uh, you can generate digital value for your car or for your home if you want to do that. So there is a project, like I said, Centrifuge, if you want to look that up. Uh, which are actually doing that they're actually working with ave at the moment if that rings a bell mm -hmm. so yeah <laughs> and are there projects that are doing different things with real world utility that you know uh, of, or is no, it just I'm aware of. no it's mostly it's mostly digital Mo mm -hmm. most of them are digital i don't think there's anyone right now that's doing anything aside from centrifuge okay but still nevertheless that's something interesting to check out and when it comes to marketing Certain chains seem to take the lead on that and do very well. Other ones seem to be lacking. Uh, what can you say about DOT and its ability to market to regular retail investors, other businesses, venture capitals, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, for venture capitals, it's definitely not a problem because they all heard about Polkadot. And so they all, they're all connected. They all know uh, which parachains are about to launch. And so they're usually the ones that fund these parachains because remember, if you become a parachain, you don't receive any funding from the community themselves. So you need to rely on some sort of funding, right? You, you've become a parachain thanks to the community because of that auction system, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you, you don't have any funding. So you have to rely on those VCs. And so that's where the VCs come into play. So I don't think it's an issue of marketing from the VC side. It's more of an issue of marketing uh, from um, from the product side. So it's the product that's that's not doing a very good job at the moment trying to market themselves and uh, trying to showcase the utility of the of the whole ecosystem. And I would say also the lingo that's being used. I mean, if we look at the wiki page for Polkadot, uh, some of the wording that Gavin Wood uses is very complex. It's very hard to understand. If you want to translate that to other languages, it's very, very complex. And so they're kind of suffering from that aspect, but there are a lot of stuff being done right now. Like there's a community called the WAG Media, uh, which is an initiative to actually uh, translate a lot of these documents into different languages and uh, to uh, have um, basically um, articles that are already out there for all these different parachains explaining what they're doing, translated into different languages, but also to help market, to help push out the word, uh, be it through Twitter interactions or through YouTube or different methods. So that's a pretty good system to, to help spread the word about Polkadot. And I heard a little bit of history that Gavin used to help out with Ethereum, and then he decided to branch off and start off Polkadot. And so that's the same guy that you were talking about just now, right? Gavin Wood is exactly, his name? yeah, yeah. Gavin Wood. He is the uh, he. I mean, he used to be the co-founder of Polkadot. Now I don't know if you probably heard that he stepped uh, out and mm -hmm. is now a chief architect at Polkadot, at Parity, I should say, because he's working for Parity Technologies, the company behind Polkadot. Yeah. Uh, and Kusama, which is the Canary Network. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, he he's always been techie. He loves the techie side. Uh, so I think that he's actually he's actually made the right choice to step out rather than be the face of the ecosystem uh, because he just wasn't happy with uh, with all the stuff that were going on as a as a leader as a as a co-founder. Uh, you know, it's not the same being the techie guy as being the co-founder. Right? And he likes to code. I mean, that's that's his uh, passion. And mm -hmm. so I think he's in the right place right now, but uh, we'll have to see how things go. We are waiting for an official statement from the new co-founder, Bjorn. Uh, Robert Habermeyer is another co-founder who's still in that position. Uh, so he hasn't left. Uh, he's been attending different events as well. And so we're waiting for the new guy who replaced Gavin Woods to come out with a public statement very soon. So keep your eyes out on that. For sure. It's just interesting because when I think of that, I don't think of some superstar behind it because if you watch let's say sports 
sometimes you'll hear about a team and there's one particular player that really shines a light on it. So when I think of Dot, I thought maybe it would be Gavin Wood. It is. But now that he's stepping down more to focus on, on the tech side and he doesn't want to be in that spotlight, it makes me really wonder, can Dot find somebody that can have that star power to bring more attention to what's happening on Dot and Kusama, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, the real reason why people associate Gavin Wood to the star label, and, and I did this myself, to be honest, as well at the beginning, is mostly because uh, he was the co-founder of Ethereum, and he was also responsible for building the Solidity programming language, which Ethereum was built in. And so that definitely helped him, you know, and Polkadot as well, especially at the beginning in 2021, even parts of 2020 when they launched. There was a lot of hype around Polkadot back then. Everyone wanted to learn how the power chain auctions work, how the crowd loans work. You know, but uh, yeah, him stepping down was definitely a hit to the ecosystem in that sense for people outside of the ecosystem, right? Anyone who was in the ecosystem and understood what Gavin Wood is really good at understood that it's not a bad thing, but they did understand that it is a bad thing from a marketing perspective because at the end of the day, marketing does help as well, right? I mean, without marketing, nothing can really flourish 100%. So you could have the best tech in the world, but if you don't know how to spread the word about it, who's going to hear about you, right? So I think that's where they kind of got hit. And that's where you see all the different YouTubers talking about Gavin Wood in a negative sense that he stepped out. Some have even claimed that he's, he left Polkadot, which is absolutely not true, but it was just a misunderstanding, I guess. Maybe didn't read the full article. Mm. Uh, but uh, yeah, just to be clear, from the Polkadot ecosystem, everyone that I was speaking with, uh, people that are well-connected in there with, uh, with founders, and so on. I mean, they're all pretty comfortable with the situation and we are waiting for that uh, official statement. However, I do think that now that Gavin has more time to focus on the dev stuff, uh, he, his dev activity, I mean, if you look at his GitHub page, if you're, you don't even have to be a, uh, a dev, you simply check his GitHub activity because you can find that and you can see that there's a lot more activity since he stepped out mm -hmm. than before. So that's definitely a good sign. I mean, more dev activity can, can be anything bad, right? That's at the, at, the, at the end of the day, it's all about improving your product, right? And so that's mm -hmm. what we're going to see with Polkadot. For sure. So how would you describe the Polkadot community as a whole? Because you have your YouTube channel, you've been in the space for a long time, very knowledgeable about the ecosystem. So how would you describe the community and also compare it to different communities out there? Yeah, I mean, the community is probably not the same as the Cardano community, I would say, because I, I used to be in that community for a while as well, and they're definitely more active. They're definitely more supportive of each other. Mm. I've noticed that the Polkadot community was really good, like in 2021, because of the parachain auctions, because people were making money, because a lot of people were in it for the money, not really for the tech, mm -hmm. uh, which is understandable. You know, I mean, you get a lot of investors in crypto, but... Uh, Right now, I do have to say that the sentiment is kind of down and mostly because of the prices not performing well when it comes to a lot of these parachain coins. The, the projects are doing well. I mean, they are like, we, we know about four or five of them, which are like the top ones and are doing extremely well delivering. However, the price isn't helping, right? And it is the bear market as well. So because of that, people aren't happy and they feel like they've been uh, wrecked. You know, they've been uh, impacted by these investments. And so the sentiment is quite low. I haven't joined the other ecosystems right now just to see what the sentiment is like in these moments. But I can tell you, like from the Polkadot one, which I'm constantly in, it's, it's not, not a great one uh, from an investor perspective. But from a dev perspective, from the techie one, it's definitely flourishing and it's doing really well. Hmm. So what's your vision of DOT? Like, what do you, how do you see them progressing and where do you hope that they go? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, uh, the way I see DOT right now is I think that they're going to make things simpler going forward. I don't think we're going to have uh, the 100 parachains that, uh, you know, Gavin Wood told us about that. That's like the limit we're going to have. We're probably going to have less than that, but I think that they're all going to be aggregated together eventually. And we're going to see uh, maybe like a smaller parachains be built on top of the bigger parachains. And so those layer ones are going to turn into layer twos eventually, I think, uh, because I just don't see the reason for us to have like four different DeFi uh, parachains like we do have right now. I think one is more than enough, to be fair. Uh, with the NFT ones, I mean, I would say the same there. You know, if we're going to get some more NFT ones or video gaming ones, I would mm -hmm. say the same there. I mean, we don't need to have like multiple ones. It's okay to have some sort of competition, but at the same time, you have to look at the use case and the and the number of users on it, right? I mean, how many players can you really bring 
onto you, right? Uh, I mean, it's usually one that does really well, uh, as you've probably seen with other projects as well. So I would say like uh, long term, I would see more aggregation happening. And I do, I do think that Polkadot is going to do well when we're going to get those uh, bridges over to different ecosystems like Cosmos, Binance, Marchin, because that will mean that it has reached its mission or completed its mission of uh, being an interoperable ecosystem. So when all these different chains, I'm talking about, let's say, Binance Smart Chain and DOT, et cetera, and they're able to bridge together, how yeah. do you see that type of atmosphere? Do you see it that like one chain is going to like suck up more of the users or the liquidity? Do you see it that they're just going to complement each other? They're going to consolidate? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping that they're going to complement each other, but that's a really tricky question because you can never know what users are going to choose. I mean, this whole ecosystem, I mean, since I've been in it, I've noticed that it's all based on hype and trend. And so if the trend is Cardano, everyone's going to jump to Cardano. If the trend is Polkadot because of something, because of some uh, new feature which looks uh, tempting for the typical investor, for the typical user, then you're going to see projects actually move to that ecosystem and take advantage of that trend to profit off that trend as well, not only uh, from a technical aspect, but also from a financial aspect. And so we've seen a lot of that, and I think it's going to be the same here. I think uh, it all depends on what the trend is going to be at the time. It's very hard to tell right now. Uh, how things are going to go uh, going forward. But yeah. So not talking from a financial aspect, but just purely from a technical aspect, what are your top three favorite chains or projects that you see in the ecosystem that really captures your interest? Yeah, absolutely. So the first one, I would have to say it's Moonbeam. Uh, if you haven't heard of it already, uh, they are a very known EVM smart contract solution project on uh, Polkadot. They've also got a canary network called Moon River on Kusama, which is basically an, an equal copy, but it's on a testing ground. So they're testing all of their uh, features on Moon River, and then they get deployed to Moonbeam, which is on Polkadot as a layer one solution. So the reason why that's my favorite is because it has the largest number of dApps built on it. So the largest number of layer two solutions on it and also the most dev activity. They're also very active in terms of partnerships, in terms of attending conferences to spread the word. They're really marketing themselves really well. And so to me, that's like doing really, really well in terms of future progress. However, in terms of price for your typical investor, I don't think it's going to do that well in the near term, simply because there are still a lot of... Uh, private investor unlocks happening at the moment and also the crowd loan unlocks because anyone who contributed to their crowd loans at the end of 2021 are still receiving those rewards and so you know they are free to sell at the end of the day and so that's something that uh, your typical user has to keep in mind as well uh, but from a technical perspective they're definitely one of my favorite like I, I see a bright future ahead of them uh, as my number one uh, moving on to number two uh, doing something very similar to Moonbeam is Astar Network uh, however, they're more focused in Japan. So they're trying to capture the Asian market rather than uh, the American market and the rest of the world like Moonbeam are doing. And so they've got partnerships even with the uh, uh, Japanese government. I mean, it's, it's insane. And they're actually working with Sony now and with Bandai as well, the company behind the famous uh, Dragon Ball anime and other animes in Japan. Like I'm, I'm a huge fan of Dragon Ball myself. And so when I heard that, I was like, wow, that's interesting. So what they're going to do is they're going to make that the chain for gaming eventually. And uh, you're going to see more uh, collaborations there as well because it is a smart contract platform. Uh, you can build the EVM dApps on there and also WASM dApps, WebAssembly. Uh, so I see that as my uh, as the second biggest, I would say, just because they're kind of focused on that Asian market and are trying to um, try to attract the, the rest of the world, US and other countries. So that's that's the reason I would say that's number two. And then the third one I would say is BitCountry, uh, BitCountry Metaverse. It's the only Metaverse platform on Polkadot. Well, they're not on Polkadot at the moment. They're on Kusama, the Canary Network, but they will launch on Polkadot uh, probably sometime next year, probably in Q1 from what they're saying. Uh, but they're the only metaverse platform in the ecosystem right now. And they've even got like a social login with Twitter. So you don't even need to go through that complex Polkadot wallet, which many people are complaining about. Cool. You simply go in with your Twitter account right now and you just connect and you enter the metaverse and you can just start roaming around there. Uh, if you own land, you can build in, on that land and so on. And so I, I see great potential there. What they're ultimately trying to do there is they're trying to create a metaverse where people like content creators like ourselves 
can create a world where they can hold like AMAs, for example, and they can bring their community over there in the metaverse. You'll actually have people walking around there watching on a screen while Professor Crypto Banana is talking on the screen, presenting in the metaverse. So it is pretty awesome. I mean, I've seen how it actually looks and how it works in action. So yeah, absolutely amazing. And those are those are my top three. For sure. Okay, but you brought up an interesting point is how friendly is it for new people to operate in the ecosystem of DOT and the parachains? Yeah, it's not very friendly. Mm. <laughs> First of all, like if you're a, a regular user and you're not techie, I mean, just trying to set up the wallet and uh, trying to understand how to operate that wallet, it can be quite complex. Uh, the, this is the Polkadot.js uh, browser extension, which then links to the Polkadot web wallet. That is quite techy and quite complicated. I have done a tutorial on my channel explaining how it works. I've done one for every year. I've got a 2020 version, a 2021 version, a 2022 version with all the different updates. So the 2023 one is going to come soon, of course, in January. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, the good thing is that there are third-party companies that, are, that uh, have been uh, discussing with Parity and have been building uh, their own versions of the wallet to simplify, to make it easier for you to contribute to a, a Parachain auction. Uh, to make it easier for you to stake because staking did seem quite complicated on the official one as well uh, they've recently simplified it a bit but there have been incidents in the past where people have accidentally tried what's the point of having test chains because i believe kusama you said was a canary network and it was for testing what's the point like it's good for developers to make sure that their stuff works yeah but from a retail side or anybody that's in it why why would they care about kusama yeah i mean uh, that was uh <laughs> That's actually one of the concerns right now, but uh, we'll kick it off with uh, why it was needed at the beginning. So before Polkadot was launched, Kusama was actually launched, which was launched at the end of 2019, in fact. And you could have set up a wallet and you could have joined the Kusama uh, chain and you could have started staking your coins from back then, uh, right? But uh, the reason why Kusama, which is the Canary network, and it's not actually a test network, I would say it's a staging network, staging environment, because staging environments are usually in production, right, when it comes to development, uh, whereas Rokoku is the actual testing environment with test coins and nothing of real value. Kusama is of real value because it's a staging environment. So anything from Rokoku goes over to Kusama. It gets tested in a real live network there on the staging environment. And they're obviously testing the scalability, the interoperability, the security, everything that I've been talking to you about um, Polkadot is, can be done on Kusama as well, equally the same. The only difference is that the parachain auction leases last for 11 months on Kusama versus 22 months on Polkadot. So that was kind of more attractive because being locked up for 11 months in order to get some coins as a reward because you've helped support that project has definitely helped, you know, and helped attract a lot of uh, investors, but also builders. There were like, like I was telling you, Moon River, the Canary Network of uh, uh, Moonbeam on uh, Kusama has a lot of dApps on it. And it has been doing extremely well when it launched simply because that was the only one available. Now we've got two. So now we can go back to the point that you are saying, why do we need the two, right? Because now we've got the Kusama one with a fully working, fully operational system, but then we've got the Polkadot ones. So why do we need the two? Well, the reality is we don't need the two. The reality is we could potentially migrate anything that's on Kusama over to Polkadot and that's it. And then just finish it on Kusama. Wait for the next one to launch, launch it on Kusama, do your testing, if everything's fine, launch it on Polkadot. We don't really need the two running at the same time. However, there are certain use cases there with some parachain teams saying, no, we actually need the two. The reason is because if we are to separate them then, uh, and we are to keep only one, then what would happen to all the liquidity from that Canary network all moving over to the Polkadot one? That would then affect and kill our network on the on the canary and they need the canary because they do all their testing on the canary and they want that live uh, for insurance to make sure that they launch a bug free product onto the main network and so you could see that there are some use cases right now however what we don't agree with in the community is the dual coin model uh, which we have right now uh, with a lot of these parachains you've got an independent coin on the canary and then one on the polka dot version uh, which can cause uh, conflicts because, uh, you know, it kind of divides the community in some way. So, All right. Well, thank you, Claudio, a.k.a. Cryptos Chain. 
you are definitely knowledgeable in the space. So where can the audience find you? What's some of your background history for producing content? Yeah, so people can find me on uh, YouTube with uh, at Cryptos Chain. Thankfully, YouTube has just recently launched a new feature where you can tag people with the ad sign. So that's great. At Cryptos Chain with a K is very important. Uh, so Cryptos as in the plural, right? Chain, all one word. And you can also find me on Twitter with the exact same uh, tag as well, uh, at Cryptos Chain over there as well. I'm also on Telegram with the exact same tag as well. So uh, I've recently opened an Instagram, but I don't use it. I've just opened it just because I don't want some uh, people to impersonate me. But uh, yeah, if you want to find me, just uh, YouTube, Twitter, and uh, Telegram. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm... Uh, doing Polkadot content mostly. Sometimes I look into the Cosmos ecosystem just to diversify uh, because it can get boring covering Dot all the time, I have to say, but uh, especially in a bear market when there aren't that many news sometimes. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I love this ecosystem. I think it's great. It's an ecosystem of interoperability. Uh, Gavin Wood is now in charge of the tech side, so I, we can expect great things to come uh, in the coming weeks and months from this ecosystem with some awesome announcements, especially with some really really cool uh, technical functionalities such as new bridging technologies etc awesome all right well thanks for coming on again and i'll talk to you soon thank you for watching take care